Well, showing up is um, a term that we use. I actually first sort of um, hit upon what we call the quadrants. And they, even though they, they turn out to be unbelievably present and common almost everywhere, they, very, very few people actually recognize them, uh, know they're there, and, and know to look for them. I started writing one of um, sort of one of the most major uh, books that I've done called Sex, Ecology, Spirituality. And I started writing that book, and I realized that there was something that was just off. Um, and I was looking at these growth hierarchies. And for some reason, um, there was an enormous number of them. They seemed in some very vague sense to be covering the same basic levels or stages, waves of development, but, but, but not exactly. And they did seem to be somehow, there were some major differences between them. And I couldn't figure out exactly what they were. So even um, to give some simple examples, we talked about um, Gebser's simple stages of archaic to magic, to mythic, to rational, to pluralistic, to integral. Those are um, a series of growing up stages. But then you can also just look at evolution itself. And that goes from, again, subatomic particles to atoms and atoms to molecules, molecules to cells, cells to organisms, organisms in more complex and differentiated fashion. And, and these are both clearly hierarchies. They're evolutionary hierarchies, growth hierarchies. Each stage transcends and includes its predecessor. So they have certain similarities, but they don't just match up level to level something is going on here and it, they just weren't fitting together right so i started taking all of the hierarchies that i was aware of and i would write one hierarchy on you know those big yellow legal pads i would just write one hierarchy on each yellow pad and i tear the sheet out put it on the floor and then write another one on tear it out, put it on the floor and i had over a hundred sheets of paper lying all over the floor with all of these growth hierarchies, all of them. They literally covered um, the floor in most of the house. And what I would do each day is just get up and walk through and look at all of those and go, you know, what is going on here? <clears throat> at one point, I remembered that a lot of the world's metaphysical or mystical philosophers maintain that a universe came into being when subject and object were divided. And they especially meant subject as mind and object as matter, but they would say that the subject and, and object, that's what they were really talking about. And so I looked at all these hierarchies I had, and indeed, I'll, I'll say about half, I don't know exactly how much it was, but roughly half, half of them were hierarchies that applied to the subjective domain. And the other half really did apply to an objective domain. So Gebser's stages, those apply to subjective worldviews. They're actually what happens in us, magic to mythic to rational, pluralistic, and so on. And that atoms to molecules to cells, that's happening in an objective realm. So we have all of these subjective growth hierarchies and all these objective growth hierarchies. And so I divided them that way. And that made a lot of sense. And, and, and it worked out well. Again, about half were one, half were the other. But there were still some differences and I couldn't quite figure out. And so another month or two staring at all of these yellow pads all over the floor. Um, and it just hit me that, that um, again, about half of them were applying to individuals. And, and that could be individual subject or individual object and the other half were collective so if you take individual atoms for example and you draw those together into a collective you form a galaxy and then as atoms as an individual hold on 
individual entity moves from atoms to molecules, then molecules make much larger chains and they can actually create sort of mineral and crystal. And if you bring those together in a collective form, you create planets. And so then, okay, so that's from galaxies to planets, atoms to molecules. If you take molecules and create cells and then draw a cell together into a group, that always happens on a planet, and it'll be some sort of biosphere, some sort of ecosphere that will be created as all those cells come together. And then if you draw those cells together into animals, and then animals come together, they'll tend to form something like families, for example. So you had, and, and then this, the same kind of thing was a occurring in the interiors. You could have an individual go through particular stages, and then you could have um, families and um, towns even, certainly civilizations, have a general center of gravity that the collective was adapted to. And so putting those together actually gave us four, what we call four quadrants. So you had the individuals on the upper two and the collective on the lower two, and then subjective or interior realities on the left hand, and the objective or exterior realities on, on the right hand. And those turned out to be unbelievably fundamental distinctions that at least this universe has made in its own construction and, and evolution. And I said these turn out to be very common because what they, one of the ways to look at them is um, you're dealing with these interior realities, these subjective dimension, and then you're dealing with exterior or objective dimension, individual and collective. And so um, what often happens is that the two exteriors, like atoms, galaxies, molecules, planets, those often just get treated as just one reality because they're all material, they, they all have exterior. And so if you have like a natural scientist who's a biologist and they're looking at it in a subjective exterior way, then they're gonna look at a living biological animal as being composed of cells and molecules and atoms and so on. In other words, just exteriors. They're not looking at a biological animal and saying, oh, this has certain subjective impulses and it has certain worldviews and, and we can measure these in humans and that kind of thing. Um, so those are often uh, fused together, the two right-hand quadrants. And that gives us um, just three major dimensions. So you find these three major dimensions, or all four, uh, an enormous number of areas. One of the most common is, is just the good, the true, and the beautiful. So the beautiful, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, aesthetics is in the interior of an individual awareness. That's where beauty arises. There's no natural scientist that says, oh, this animal is objectively has beauty and this animal objectively does not. So beauty is in the eye of, of the beholder. Um, goodness is how you and I treat each other as subject. It's an inner subjective moral or ethical reaction. That's what we call the lower left. That's a subjective collective. It's how an individual subject treats other subjects. It's not how I treat you as an object. That's usually thought of as being not very moral at all. And most people don't want that. Uh, and then truth, in this case, good, the true, and the beautiful. True just means objective, third-person truth. And that's the right-hand quadrant. And so you can see, I just said third-person, and that's right, because these big three are also first person, second person, third person pronoun. And every major language in the world has first, second, and third person pronouns. First person is the person speaking, that's I or me, that beauty, aesthetic dimension. And then second person is the person being spoken to, so that's you, and an I and a you form a we, so that's ethics, that's morals. And then third person is it, or there's him, her, or just it or its. So that's what objective science attempts to do. It's not looking for beauty. It's not looking for morals or values. It's looking for objective truth.
And so you have the good, the true, and the beautiful. You have first, second, and third person. And it also turns out, of course, that many, many different human disciplines focus on just one of these quadrants. So if you are looking at individual developmental psychology, you're studying the stages that the upper left, the interior of an individual consciousness, the stages that that goes through as it grows and develops. You're not studying objective brain, third person brain structures. You're doing that if you study neurophysiology or brain chemistry or something like that. And notoriously, people who study neurophysiology, brain chemistry, don't believe in subjective stages of development because they don't believe in subjective reality. They just believe objective reality is real. So that's one of the problems is that you have these four quadrants. And the whole point is that what they really represent is just the division of the universe into subjective and objective and singular and plural. That's it. These two fundamental distinctions create these quadrants. And that's why they're bloody well everywhere. And the only problem is there are almost no human disciplines that include all four of them. So they're looking at just the sort of upper right individual holons, just atoms are real, and that's it. Um, and then systems theorists come along and they go, no, just systems are real. Individual holons aren't real, just the lower right quadrant, collective, exterior, third person, objective system. That's what's real. And that includes all reality. And you go, well, are you including beauty in that? Are, are you including moral values in that? Are you just including these exterior systems? Go, oh, well, maybe we're just including exterior systems. We don't think beauty is, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and then you have interiors, and, and there are um, some people that think just those are real. Idealists, notoriously, think that just consciousness as, as a reality is what's ultimately real. Um, and so the whole point about these four different quadrants is it was important to include all of those. And that's what I simply call, it was important to show up for all of these fundamental dimensions of reality because they're very real, they're very important, and they're all there, they all exist. And so it's been one of, um, the things that I've ended up doing is looking at disciplines in each of these uh, quadrants. And particularly the upper left, um, as we in the West really became more and more scientific with the Western Enlightenment, the whole notion was that the only thing that was real is something that we could all publicly see, something that really was an objective exterior thing that we could measure or somehow quantify and that's what was real and as far as our individual minds our individual psyches well you see i can't see yours and you can't see mine so we can't really study that so psychology stopped being the study of the psyche and it just became behaviorism what's real is only what you can actually see a person do so you can see their behavior we can all see their behavior so that's real but any impulses or ideas or concepts producing that behavior, those are nothing but their behavioral third person manifestation. And so things like subjective development, developmental psychology, that wasn't included in any form of behaviorism. That wasn't really real. And then we did get people start to say, no, wait a minute. There really is such a thing as moral reality. And by the way, those morals develop. You can actually tell when a person's at different stages of moral development, among other things, by simply how they will answer certain questions. So um, just to give a very simple, quick example, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, who was a, a pioneering genius in, in the measurement of moral development, he would use just simple questions like, um, a man is married to a woman who has a terminal illness and the local pharmacy has a drug that will cure her illness, but the man can't afford it. Does he have the right to steal that medicine? And Colbert found that he got three major answers. 
people would say yes, or they'd say no. Or then another group would also say yes, but for very, very different reasons than the first group. So if you go back to the first group and says, yes, the right man has the right to steal, and you ask them why, they'll say, well, because I can do anything I want. If I want to go steal the medicine, I'll steal the medicine. By the way, fuck you. <laughs> now, this is known as pre-conventional or egocentric stages of development. Carol Gilligan, who's a student of Colburn, was calling the selfish stage. The next group says no. And you say, well, why not? And you say, well, stealing is against the law. Society says that's wrong. I couldn't go out and do something like that. It would be illegal. It would be horrible. And so across the board, they say no. Some of these stages are also given names like conformists um, because the person can now take the role of other. They can see that there's another perspective, but they end up trapped in that perspective. So they end up identifying with that. And so they end up conforming to whatever their group wants. Colbert uh, simply called them conventional because they follow the conventions of society. And then they have this third group that says, yes, you can steal it. The man can steal it. And they say, okay, why? And they say, well, because life is worth more than $28 a bottle. And he has the right to do that. And so they're making their decisions based on universal moral principles that apply across the board and for all people. So they're not just being egocentric um, about it. And so Colbert called that post-conventional and Gilligan called it, she called the conventional stages care stages because people can actually start caring for people other than themselves, but they just care for their group. So it's a very us versus them kind of morality. And then the these highest stages, she called universal care because then the person cares for all human beings, regardless of race, color, sex, gender, ethnicity, or creed. And so that's a, obviously a very high moral development. But the point is those stages are real. You can determine those stages. There's a, a certain sense of where you can measure them um, by using these qualitative tests and measurements. Now, every major developmental psychologist in the world did something like that. And they ended up studying cognitive development, emotional development, moral development, aesthetic development, verbal development, mathematical development, and so on. Those are all areas that somebody who believes in just the upper right, just the exterior of the individual, doesn't believe any of those are real. And so you've just thrown out the entire suite of growing up. By the way, you've also thrown out waking up because that's just another subjective state you're having and we don't believe that's real. And the problem is, of course, most orthodox natural science believes just in the upper right quadrant, just atoms, just molecules, just cells, a third person, singular, individual, whole on. That's all that's real. None of the other quadrants are real. They don't even believe systems are real. Systems are just a, a bunch of individual real holons slammed together in a group. And then that's all you have. They're not really real in themselves. And they don't believe in any of the interior or left hand. So that was a big deal. And for me, sex ecology, spirituality, that actually marked the beginning of, of what students um, will call Wilbur Four, because that's where I really started including not just these different levels of development, which I had down to a fairly fine understanding, and not just different lines of development that went through those levels, and not just shadow material and cleanium. But I started explicitly including all four quadrants in any analysis I did of anything, because all four of them were always there. I mean, there's not a single thing you can point to in the universe that doesn't have all four quadrants. And that includes things like electrons and photons. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. So if you want to not only grow up and wake up and clean up, but if you want to show up for reality, then make sure you're including these fundamental dimensions of reality. They're very real, they're very present, and they will change how you look at almost anything that you are examining and trying to figure out. And one of the real problems in academia today is not only are many academic disciplines confined to just a few levels 
of development using just a few lines of development, they almost always think that only one, maybe two at the most, quadrants are real. All the others aren't real. And so that is, that just, you're going to get it wrong right from the start. I mean, at least in the sense that you're not going to be complete or comprehensive in, in including those areas that are indeed having a major impact on what you're looking at. So this is, um, showing up is really important. A lot of people will actually start to get a sense about what something integral looks like when they first see the quadrants and they see different theorists in each quadrant that we're saying it's real and they see different types of disciplines in each quadrant and how those are all different and they recognize all of them they intuitively know all of those are real and so they'll go oh i get it now now i see what integrals trying to do so showing up turned out to be um i think a really um a really important discovery and in this case it was a discovery of something that was just lying all over the place anyway um it, it was just everywhere um and um but it, it wasn't getting recognition it just wasn't getting any sort of um, attention so enter the future thinkers giveaway and win our brand new community membership including in-depth courses private calls and more as well as a supply of qualia a complete cognitive upgrade for your brain to enter the contest, simply go to futurethinkers.org slash giveaway and sign up for our mailing list to instantly get our 50-page guide on how to adapt to the future. There are many ways to increase your chances of winning. Enter the competition today. The brand new Future Thinkers members portal is now live. Develop your sovereignty and self-knowledge with our in-depth courses, get access to our weekly sense-making calls, join the Q&As with past podcast guests, and much more. Become a Future Thinkers member today at futurethinkers.org slash members. To stay up to date with new episodes, subscribe to Future Thinkers on your favorite platform. And leave us a review or a like. It really helps out the show. And don't forget to share this episode on social media.